Press. The United Press. There have been several printed reports in the past week that you are considering or thinking about when world conditions permit, stepping out of office and turning over the reins of government to Vice President Nixon. What do you think of these reports? Well, I think it's the worst rot that I've heard since I've been in this office. The, um, I uh, frankly know of no reason why any speculative writer should at least doubt my basic integrity and honesty. And when I gave to the people of the United States the opinion of the doctors that I could undertake again a four-year tour of duty as president, I said it was my intent and purpose to carry it honestly and do it that way. Now, I cannot imagine where these stories came from, and I can say no more about it. Yeah, when Mr. Brownell was testifying before the House Judiciary Health Committee recently, support of the administration bill on presidential disability, members expressed uh, objection to having the cabinet with the vice president make the decision. Some said that the cabinet would be so loyal to the president they would never certify he was disabled. The other side said that the cabinet by getting up with the vice president to oust the president. Would you tell us why you chose the cabinet as the Albany to do it? Well, uh, first place, let's get one thing clear. All we sent to Congress was a suggestion of how something might be done, and we sent it because uh, we thought, in view of all the studies going on down there, they would want the results of those studies. I have no official function in the amending of the Constitution, and what we proposed was to amend the Constitution. Now, in all the study of it, here is what we ran into. There's only two people in the United States that are elected by all of the people, the president and the vice president. And we ran into the, the feeling that the people of the United States would resent very bitterly any effort or any uh, uh, opportunity for anyone antagonistic the President just to give him uh, the old heave ho on a political uh, basis and get rid of it. So uh, because we take in the one case, the first case we covered, the President himself knows. Let's say he's going into the hospital for a very dangerous operation of some kind and he may be out for seven days or eight days where he can't even communicate to anyone. He says, all right, I'm temporarily disabled, and it's provided for that way. There could be a case where a man have a, a stroke that is slight from which they'd recover. We have great statesmen in the world today that recovered from a couple of them and carried on for years. But he wouldn't be able to say, I am incapable of acting, because he'd be unconscious. Now, the vice president, as we see under the present uh, wording of the Constitution, the Vice President himself has to decide this. But he's always been reluctant to do it because he says, how would we turn it back at the end? Or do I become President for the whole time? Or am I acting President or am I really the President? And it's astonishing how um, full our records are of contrary opinions on this thing. Now, so we said, all right, the President is appointed, uh, the uh, Cabinet is appointed by the President. So if the Vice President decides that the Vice pre that the President is uh, out, of, uh, out of circulation for uh, a brief time or a longer time, he goes to the cabinet, lays it before them, and if the majority of the cabinet, presumably friends of the president appointed by him say, yes, that's right, he takes over. And until the president is again able to say, I now resume, uh, I'm now able to resume my office, why he would continue to act in that capacity. Now, let us remember that behind this whole thing is the uh, ability and the power in the Congress to impeach a president. Presumably, if a, if a president got in such shape that he was just acting wildly and unconstitutionally, that would happen. That is the final, uh, final uh, protection of the people against a president who is absolutely unable to discharge the function of his office, but doesn't know it. In other words, we, we assume we're dealing with honest people. We're not dealing with people that are jockeying against each other to uh, seize power. We're dealing with honest people, and that's what the this amendment does. Mr. President, I think uh, Mr. Roberts of the Washington Post. <coughs> we last seen you, sir. There have been reports uh, printed both here and abroad that 
either on last election day or the day before, you invited uh, Prime Minister Eden and Premier Mole to fly to the United States to announce a ceasefire in the Suez War in the White House. Could you tell us the facts of these reports? To announce this in the White House? Yes, or here. Well, I can tell you that. No, that was never done. Now, I never, as you know, discussed the details of communications between myself and heads of other governments, and for obvious reasons, because these people expect their communications, to the, their confidence to be respected, I do. But I will say this, we had a great deal of conversation about the wisdom of such a meeting. And uh, we talked it over, and uh, we talked it over several times, and finally decided until the situation was such that it would be understood by the whole world we should not have it. And then later we decide there should be a uh, bilateral meetings instead of uh, tripartite. Mr. President, Mr. President, of the El Paso Times, sir, and with regard to this commission that you might appoint for investigating the monetary situation, there are two bills, I believe, for Congress uh, that have your support. Uh, one uh, phase of the bill calls for um, uh, exemption from the uh, conflict of interest statutes for the members whom you might appoint. <laughs> I wonder if you would appoint bankers to investigate themselves? Well, I would think that uh, anybody in the United States that is in, uh, heavily engaged in business is certainly uh, concerned with our monetary system.